All right, how's everyone doing today? Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, it is warm out, and uh, where I'm living in Sacramento, it's, it's getting warm, and I need, I don't have any t-shirts, and hey, Bruce, how's it going? And so I need to order some of those soon, but um, I may be sweating in this long sleeve shirt. But nonetheless, here we are. This is going to be podcast 226. This is going to be how to practice how to efficiently practice anything, how to practice anything efficiently. And I'm going to go through a process right now. And that process is going to take you through five different steps, which I'm going to talk about in the podcast when I get there in a second. And the five different steps are going to be very crucial to almost anything you practice. And so like I like to do, this is going to be more of a general bird's eye view. We have a pretty intimate audience right now, only 15 people on here. So again, if you guys have any questions at all, I just jumped to 19, but if you have any questions at all, please, please let me know. And essentially, uh, I will do a Q&A after the live podcast recording is over. So I always do this at the end of the live podcast recording. If you're new here, thanks for joining us. And the perks of sticking around and joining these live streams is that I do do a Q&A at the end. You can ask me any questions you want, um, you know, preferably around the podcast topic, which is usually nice. But again, if you have some other questions that kind of branch off, that's fine as well. So um, again, my name is Brendan Lowe, creator and founder of Jazz Piano School. Again, if you guys are new here, you can go to jazzpianoschool.com, check out any of the information. And um, if you're not on the uh, the live stream list, go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast. So um, I don't think there's anything else. I'm going to dive in here because I got a lot of good stuff to get going. And again, feel free to chat in the comments there. And I know <laughs> this is going to be a great subject. I know there's, everyone's going to have a lot of questions about this. And I'll try and get to as many as possible. But again, practice is really a subject that people, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. You know, I'll be the first one to say it. And it's difficult to understand what, what should be the process, especially if you're the student. I mean, I don't, I don't blame anyone for not knowing what to do or what to practice. I mean, that's the teacher's job, right? It's the teacher's job to help guide you and understand, you know, help lead you through the, the, the direction that you should be taking with your practice routine. And a lot of times if, you know, a lot of you are on here, you may not have a teacher and you're kind of kind of piecing things together. That's okay too, but it's just hard to understand. Hopefully this process will kind of demystify the, the steps that you should be taking. So I think that's it. And I'm just going to dive right in here and start recording. I'm feeling pretty good. Hey everyone. Hey Key. Um, hey Carmen. Thanks so much for being here. Hey Drew from Brooklyn. Nice. I lived in New York for four years when I was in college. Love Brooklyn. Cool. I think that's it. Again, if you guys have any questions while I'm recording, go ahead and put them in there because after I'm done, I will be doing a QA. and a and uh, it's just nice to have the questions kind of lined up there so that I can launch right into the Q&A um, instead of kind of waiting to see if anyone has any questions. All right. So here we go. All right. Welcome to the Jazz Piano School podcast, episode number 226. This is going to be called How to Efficiently Practice Anything. In this particular podcast, I'm going to take a step back and go over a general practicing process, a general practicing process that's going to help you essentially tackle any part of your practice game that you want, chords, scales, modes, improv, anything you want. I'm going to teach you how to efficiently practice, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. This is the first time you're joining us, and you want to get onto the live podcast recording list. Uh, to be in the live audience like I have right now as I'm recording this, go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast, jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast, and you'll be able to get notifications about when I go live and do these podcasts recording. Also, as, as well, definitely go to jazzpianoschool.com and check out all the free education that we have available for you. So with that being said, here we go. Now, usually at this point, I like to dive right into the piano, but with this particular topic, I really need to kind of take a step back and be more of a, a teacher. I need to go into a lecture hall moment right now. And for all the YouTube scanners out there who are, you know, just so eager to get to the piano, if you drop this video or you close out, you're going to miss some, some knowledge nuggets I'm about to drop in you right now. Okay. So please be patient because I'm going to get to the piano in a second, but I need to cover some really, really important and crucial steps. 
Here are the five steps that I'm going to go over in this practicing process. Number one, discipline. Okay, number one, discipline. Number two, goals and assessment. Number two, goals and assessment. Number three, what to practice. Number four, the learning process. Okay, and number five, integration. I'll go over those one more time. Number one, discipline. Number two, goals and assessment. Number three, what to practice. Number four, the learning process. Number five, integration. All right, so number one, discipline. None of the other steps that I'm about to teach you are going to work unless you can exercise some sort of discipline, right? Some sort of discipline. So as a teacher, when I go to teach students, I don't usually, I don't teach too many live students anymore, but some of the groups that I do, uh, essentially I'll tell someone something or a student and I'll explain a concept. And immediately when the student goes back to the piano, they're doing the exact same thing that they were doing before. Have you guys experienced that? I mean, I have done it lots and lots and lots all throughout my career, all throughout my education. And it's hard. It's difficult because we need to show up to our practice environment with a mindset of discipline. Okay. How many times have you guys have sat down at the piano and you start practicing and then you kind of hear something, and then you fiddle around with something else. And then by the time you know it, you're just playing all the stuff that you know how to play already. Right. That happens to us all the time. So here's what I recommend. I recommend you take 15 minutes, literally schedule 15 minutes into your practice time, maybe once a day, right? That's all it takes, maybe 10 minutes and say within that time, I'm going to discipline myself to focus and play and practice the things that I do not know, which are going to help me get better. Remember, anytime you're practicing things you don't know, that's when you're improving. When you're playing the things you do know, there is room for improvement, but for the most part, it's already stuff you know, right? That's a general rule of thumb. So you have to discipline yourself to not approach the piano as if you know what's coming, as if you know what's going to be taught. You need to approach the piano with discipline so that you can go slowly. You can take your time. You can focus on exactly what you need to learn because, again, 99% of the time when I'm teaching someone, there's different types of students, and there's students who will listen to me and slow down and really listen to everything I'm saying and apply that knowledge. And those students make really, really quick progress in a short amount of time. And we all want that, right? That's what we all want. So the more you can discipline yourself to do that, the better you can be. There's also students who listen to me, but they're not really listening. And then they go back to kind of just doing whatever it is they were doing before, right? Discipline, number one. Step number two, goals and assessment. Goals and assessment. A lot of times, if people go, students go to play a tune. So if I were to go to play a tune, I'm just going to show you the keyboard. If I were to play a tune and I were to play this. Now, if I get to this part here and then I screw up, for example, right? This could be a lot of different things happening. That mistake can be a lot of different things, right? So it could be many, many different issues. And what you want to do is really assess what is happening in that moment, right? And this is where goals and assessment really kind of come into play. You need to understand what your goals are and then take a crucial assessment of what is not happening. What process, what system, what tool is not happening in your playing that's not allowing you to express what you want? Now, fortunately, unfortunately, a lot of students don't know, and that's why teachers are great. That's why Jazz Piano School is great, right? Because you can ask these questions, but even if you don't have access to a teacher, you can still do this manually on your own. So at the piano, I demonstrated something where I made a mistake. Now, this could be me not knowing that particular chord. Maybe I don't know how to play an E minor seven, right? I go to play a particular chord at that spot in the tune and I just don't know how to play it. It could be that I don't know how to voice it. I don't know how to voice the chord. It could be that I know how to voice the chord. I know how to play the chord, but in that particular moment, if I'm improvising or I'm playing a written lead sheet, 
it could be that my spontaneous improvisation movement of the chord is not happening. But if I'm playing the lead sheet, then that's just standard practice. That's like literally playing a classical sheet of music and getting to a spot and not hitting the right notes. That's also an issue as well. So there's many, many different issues that could come into play and you have to dissect on your own or if you have a teacher or some sort of guide, right? Guidance within an educational website like Jazz Piano School or even others with sites. Is it the chord? Do I know that chord? Do I know that line? Do I know how to improv over that particular type of harmony? Am I going too fast, right? What is the issue that's happening? And the more you can kind of dissect exactly where you are in the moment in what's happening, right? I had someone a couple of weeks ago when I was doing a live stream say, well, in this particular piece, I always get to this one spot and I can't seem to play it correctly, right? And so I took a deep, uh, deeper dive into that. And this whole time she was just trying to play the tune, right? When in actuality, the problem was that she had never practiced her minor seven flat five chords, right? She didn't know her minor seven flat five chords. So you can't expect to play the tune if there's a chord in there that you don't know. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you keep practicing the tune over and over and over again because that's not giving you the tools, right? The tune doesn't give you the tools. You need to practice the tools, put them in your tool bag, and then go back to the tune. And that's step number five of the practice process that I'm teaching you, right? Integration. That's integration of the tools. So once you've assessed the problem, then you need to isolate the problem. I'll talk about this more in a second but really focus in and understand that's the issue. So let's talk about goals and assessment now. So what are your goals, right? Let's say your goal was to play through a tune. There's many ways you can play through a tune. Let me go back to the piano here. I can play through a tune in a very, very standard way. Let's, let's um, take, you know, um, um, night and day as I was playing before. I could play it like this, just root position chords, okay, with the melody on top. Now, if you're a Jazz Piano School member, you would know that a lot of the solo piano arranging techniques I teach are going to move your shells to your left hand, or excuse me, your right hand underneath the melody and bass notes in your left hand. So instead of this, you would play this. You hear the difference there? That's a drastic difference within five seconds. This as opposed to this. Right? So if your goal is to get through the tune and practice, like playing it like this arrangement, that, that is a specific goal in itself, right? If your goal is to improvise through the tune, that's another type of goal. Maybe you wanna improvise. So on and so forth. So there's many types of goals that a student can have, and, and it's not enough that a student actually really picks a goal that is very specific. So all of us want to be able to play tunes and improvise, but having that particular goal isn't really going to help our practice session. It's not going to help our practicing. We don't really know what we want. We, like everyone wants to play jazz piano. They want to play all the different types of styles, but what, where do we even start at that point? We need to have specific goals in order to have specific practice sessions, okay? So you really have to narrow down exactly what it is you're working on. And this is why assessment is so important. So maybe you have a goal to improvise over two five ones. That's a great goal. This will drastically help narrow your practice session so you can understand the next upcoming steps I'm about to teach you, right? So you start with discipline. You pick your goal, you assess where you're at. Like maybe you're a big beginner and your assessment is, you, you do a self-assessment. I don't really know. I know my minor chords. I know my major chords, but I don't know my dominant chords. That's your self-assessment. Well, your goal should be to learn your dominant chords because, right, there's lots of dominant chords in lead sheets. And ultimately, your main goal is to play tunes, right? 
So if you don't know your dominant chords, you're not going to be able to play tunes. And that this type of assessment process is a very straightforward process, but unfortunately, just not a lot of students work through this because our brains are scattered and we just kind of we just are just jumbled. We don't really have a system. We just kind of go at a bunch of different things. It's like throwing you know what at the wall and hoping something sticks. We go on to YouTube, we watch all these different types of videos on random, random things all the time. And we expect to kind of just like get better magically. Unfortunately, I wish that's the way it worked, but it doesn't. And again, like maybe you need your voicings, like maybe you just need better voicings, right? And again, even with that category, there's many, many subcategories. All right. So goals and assessments is number two, obviously very, very important. Number three. Okay. We're getting into the piano part here. For everyone that was patient and waited, congratulations. <laughs> so here we are. So let's say your goal, like I just said, is to learn your two five ones with with better voicing. So a better voicing besides root position chords would be inversions. These is like a this is a common voicing path that I'm going to be releasing later this year in jazz piano school. These different types of paths. So inversions, right, is a just a one step up from root position chords, right? Now, if I go another step up from that, I can go to my rootless voicings, right? Now I am using rootless voicings instead of inversions. Okay. And if I go one step up from that, I can start to throw in extensions. See that? So I, th I added flat nine, flat 13 here onto my voicing. If I go one step up from that, I can start to create two hand voicings at this point with left-hand solo piano components in my arranging system. Now that was a humongous difference. Did you guys hear it? Let me revert back to the, the path, the step before. Here's rootless voicings with extensions. These, everything's happening here right now, just in my right hand. My left hand is just playing bass notes. Now check out the difference when I use my two hand voicing building process. Complete difference, right? <clears throat> so in step three, which is the step that we're on, you've done the assessment and you have a goal right? Your goal is to practice the next step up of your voicing. So let's say we're at the inversion point, right? So you know your inversions, you can voice lead them through two, five, ones in any key. Okay. But now you want better voicings. Great. Fantastic. You got your goal. You've done your assessment. You're in a disciplined state of mind. Step number three is what to practice, what to practice, right? Now, chords usually take on some sort of repetitive exercise. And again, what I like to do, I'm going to show you a system I use for chords here. I'm not going to go over all the things like improv and stuff like that, but I'll still, I'll still touch upon that a little bit. For chords, here's what I do. I do left hand alone, right? So if I was practicing my rootless voicings, for example, I'm going to do left hand alone. Okay. I'm going to do right hand alone. I'm going to do hands together. Now I'm not, I'm going to get into the learning process in a second. Okay. I'm just describing what to practice. Okay. I'm not actually showing you my practice method just yet. All right. I'm just telling you what would be the exercise. Uh, the fourth exercise would be bass note to left hand. just like that. Because in solo piano, I'm going to need to grab that bass note. And jump up whatever it is I'm playing, right? <clears throat> and the last one is going to be bass note to hands together. All right, so I'm going bass note, hands together, bass note, hands together. Okay, just like that. Now for 
a particular type of movement theory tool, what I call them, we'd be moving this through a theory process, which a lot of you are probably aware of that I use in jazz piano school. But uh, essentially what's happening here is that for chords that you just, these are like nouns in the, in the language. Like, you know, if you're learning French or Spanish, you just need to learn nouns. So <clears throat> let's say you want to say, um, you know, cat in French. You just have to learn the word cat in French. Le chat, le chat, excuse me. Or chien is dog, right? Or I am in French is je suis, right? Um, you know, s'il vous plaît, sorry. So it's the same in jazz. Like there's just some things you just need to learn. Chords and certain types of voicing movements that I teach, these processes, it's literally just like learning this stuff. It just takes time and repetition. All right, so once I go through this process again, left hand alone, right hand alone, hands together. <clears throat> bass note to chord, bass note to chord, bass note to two hands, two hands. Now there's many different ways you can do even this. Let's say you're just learning your minor, let's say you're learning one particular type of voicing. So if you're moving into a higher advanced level and you're, you're trying to apply, remember how I apply extensions to this? Flat 13, flat nine. If you're learning, let's say you're, you're learning how to apply this particular, these two particular extensions in, I would use the same process. So I'm gonna do this. Left hand alone, okay? Then I'm gonna switch keys. I'm gonna go through all the keys Excuse me. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do all the steps that I just taught you, but through the keys. Okay. So I, then I would do right hand alone. Then I would do bass. I skipped bass to left hand, but you get the picture. Okay. And then I'd go all through all the keys. You're gonna need to use this for all the keys, right? So whatever key, you know, I would just I would go the circle of fourth. So your new key would be F here, right? So then I would have this. This, 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 this. So on and so forth, okay? So I know what to practice now and then eventually we get into flashcards. Now there's, there comes a point when you're practicing scales, modes, chords and, and the student is like, ah, oh, this is so boring. I don't wanna do this anymore and like, I've been practicing these exercises for so long, but then I go and play a tune and I still can't seem to get it. <clears throat> Trust me, I get that. And <clears throat> the most important part, once you've learned something, is the randomization of it in this third step, okay? So what, I'm still on step number three, what to practice, what to practice, right? So what exercise, when I say what to practice, I mean what exercises are we practicing? Like to learn our goal. Like we have our goal, we've done our assessment, but what do we practice to get better? Chords is pretty easy. We just, like I said, it's just like learning nouns in a language. You just need to learn it in a lot of different ways. Now, once you've drilled it in a lot of different <clears throat> kind of ways like that, randomization is going to help you the most when we get to the inject, excuse me, the um, <clears throat> integration point of the chord. So to randomize things, what I highly recommend is flashcards. And, and in jazz piano school, we have flashcards in, in a computerized way where it flips and you have to kind of play it immediately. But if you just use index cards, you can do this really, really amazingly as well. So I have an index card. Let's say it says G7, uh, rootless voicing, flat nine, flat 13, which is the voicing I was just showing you. So if I pulled that card, I'd have to play that as quickly as possible. Now these cards, and again on the thing it's saying F minor seven, but there's no root there, okay? So I have my flat 13, flat nine in my shells to my G7, right? And then maybe my next card says, you know, um, F7, rootless voicing, flat nine, flat 13. Right? So I'm just pulling these flash cards and I'm just trying to get these voicings as quickly as possible. Now, it could be that you're practicing something more simple. Maybe you're practicing your drop two for your rootless voicing in your second structure. So here's my second structure, rootless voicing. All right, so I have my seven on the bottom, going to three, 
of my G7 on the bottom, going to seven of my C major seven, right? Maybe you're practicing your drop two, so you're going. So your flashcards would be essentially, you know, all the different types of two five ones in in a key. So you would just write G on your flashcard. It would just say G. So let's say I pulled a G. I would immediately play a two five one in the key of G as fast as I could. And then I would just keep going, you know? That's all that's all you would do. Now this randomization is really the key to helping you learn things so that they can spontaneously come out. I'm going to say this one more time because it's extremely, extremely important. This particular process with flashcards and the unknowing of what is coming, right? So in this particular, and it doesn't have to be flashcards, but it can be anything. So like you just have to not know what's coming in your exercise before we get to the integration part. We're, at, we're actually putting these things into a tune because you want to practice the randomization where your brain does not know what's coming next. Now, at that point where you can accomplish an exercise, where your brain doesn't know what's coming, you don't know what's coming, but you can still do it at a consistent tempo, that, that is what you're striving to get to, right? Because in that moment, you are spontaneously achieving your goal, right? And jazz is all about spontaneity, right? It's all about playing tunes and using different tools in a spontaneous motion, like right on the spot. But if you've never practiced that, when you get to the tune, what do you think is going to happen? Right? You're going to crash and burn because you've never practiced the spontaneity part. The tune is the blueprint. It's not meant for, I mean, it is meant for practicing. I'm going to get there in a second. But the, the hard work, like the bulk of the practicing is not meant for the tune. Okay? All right? We have to learn our tool first. We have to practice the spontaneity of it. And then we're going to inject it into the tune. All right? So that's step number three. I'm still on step number three here. Let's, let's review discipline, okay? Number two is goals and assessments. You have to understand and dissect what the issue is that you're having. Like, what is the issue? Really think about it. Like, what am I not able to do? And I know that's a tough one because you really need, you need a second pair of eyes. You need a teacher or you need some sort of process. You need to ask someone, right? But if you, you know, if you get to a certain level, like intermediate players should be able to do this on their own. Because you have a lot of knowledge, but there's some barrier that's blocking you, like mentally and, and, and on the piano, right? You got to step back for a moment, take a breath and be like, what is happening here? Like what, is, you know, it's like digging yourself out of a hole in life when you get kind of tied up in things. All right. And, and number three is what to practice. Now, again, like I said, if you're, if you're having a sticking point with improv, knowing what to practice, that's difficult too, right? And so if you're trying to learn how to move through chords more or your improv doesn't sound good it's really hard as a student to know what's not working you know but you're going to want to focus on your improv and a lot of the time it has to do with theoretical knowledge about the chord and the movements if i'm practicing my improv over two five one and my solo sounds like this Right? Obviously, that doesn't sound good. So what is the issue there? You know, well, there's a lot of different issues. We're, at the, we're back at the assessment process, but you really have to dissect it and say, you know, okay, if you've been listening to my, go through my podcast. Okay, you're not hitting many chord tones. That's a big issue. You're not using the connecting mode tones to move as the glue for your code to chord tones. And that's really the most important aspect of what's happening there. Okay, so if I just use chord tones alone. Already my solo is completely different than what I just played before because I was able to accurately assess the problem. Now I, I totally skipped the practice stage there, but I'm just demonstrating. Step number four is going to be the learning process. This is really, really important. Very, very important. So humans, by nature, are, are, we're incredible, incredible machines and beings. 
We're in a consistent state of adaptation, always, whether we know it or not. Our body is adapting to the, the slightest temperature changes, sleep, even 30 minutes of sleep. You know, have you ever gone to bed at like 30 minutes later or like gotten up 30 minutes earlier and you're like, I'm exhausted, right? It's so weird, but like our body is so infinitely in tune with the most nuanced details of our life you would never even imagine. But you have to remember this because when we go to practice something, the first time you play something, your body is learning it. I'm going to say that again. The first time you play something, your body is learning it. So again, let's say I wanted to learn my dominant bebop scale. Okay. So I teach a student the scale, right? And I teach them about the passing tone and they do two things. They, they remove the passing tone and they add in another note to their mixolydian scale. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. I, I got it. I got it. Then they try it again, right? And then they, maybe they get the passing tone, but they still add the, the new note to the mixolydian scale. Wait, wait, no, no, I got it. I got it. Hold on. Let me see. Let me see. No, no, no. Okay. Hold on. And by the time you know it, <laughs> their body is actually in their hand and their muscle memory. Everything about their being is learning all the different mistakes that they've just played. Like all of them, your body is learning anytime you play a mistake. And I know it's kind of dramatic, but this is the mindset you need to take when learning things. Because I guarantee if you have the discipline from step number one, you can shorten your practice time by like 100%. Like 200%. Like you can learn things in literally like four minutes guaranteed rather than like hours. Okay, so what you want to do is the very first time you go to play something, do not play it until you know exactly how to play it right. I'm going to say this again. Listen closely. Anytime you go to play something, do not play it until you know you're going to play it right. <clears throat> But Brendan, it's so complicated and I need to try it out. I understand that. But this is part of the learning process. Just <laughs> go slowly. Just go slowly. Let me show you how slow I'm talking about. And this is not a fun thing, guys. This is not a fun thing, okay? This is like watching paint dry. But trust me, if you can discipline yourself to do this, it's going to help you infinitely. So let's say the student, or let's say me, let's say I'm practicing something. What? Let's say there's a really cool movement here. Let's say I want to learn that, okay? And this would be over like an F7 sus. It's a really cool line. Right? What did I play last? I think that's what I did. Let's say I want to learn that. Right? I made a mistake there. <laughs> so I need to go back and play it again without mistakes. So this is how slow I'm going to go. I'm going to go like super slow speed. And every note I play, I'm thinking to myself, okay, is that the note that I need to play? Yes, it is. And I'm going to go to my next chord. And again, before I play this note, I'm thinking to myself, is this the correct note? Yes, it is. Okay. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Is that correct? Yep. D correct? Yep. A correct? Yep. Okay. I'm going to do this a couple times so that my body learns the notes. It's learning correctly. It's not learning mistakes. It's actually learning the correct notes. This is step number four of my pr practice process, okay? This is the learning system. Right? So now my body has learned the notes, like physically, mentally, it's still not there though, technically, right? Because we haven't really sped up the tempo or anything. Right? But I am learning it. Okay, so what's the next step? We up the tempo slowly, slowly, right? And this is where a metronome is really useful. Because a metronome is going to do one of two things. It's going to put pressure on, first of all. Like even if, even if you can play this without a metronome, like I just did. Putting a metronome on at a slower tempo is, is going to be harder than what I just did because of the pressure, right? Even if the metronome is clipping, clicking slower, 
So what I played right there was about this. But I guaranteed if I put a metronome on slower and I went to go play that, I would feel pressure. I may have some hesitations and I may, you know, make a mistake. Click, 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 click. Right? So practicing with a metronome and without a metronome are two completely different things. That's also another very valid point that you should be aware of, be conscious of, right? Because like when you're playing a tune, there's no going back. If you're performing or you're playing for yourself, your friends, there's no going back. That's why the metronome is so, so key to helping you understand and feel that pressure. Like you can't stop. There's no going back, right? All right, so I speed it up. Right? Now let's say I make a mistake. Let's say I make a mistake. And this happens so, so much. And let's say my mistake is here. Okay, so clearly... I hit a wrong note here and so many people do this and it's just, it's so hard. And I understand this is why step number one, you got to come with a disciplined mindset. You can't go back to the beginning. <laughs> okay. You, let me repeat this. You cannot go back to the beginning of the phrase. Again, let's say your lick was this. Let's say you're practicing a line. Right? Let's say you're practicing that. If you make a mistake somewhere in the middle of your practice, right? you can't go back to the beginning. You can't go, oh, let me try it again. Oh, oh okay, I got it this time. Let me try it again. Oh, shoot. No, no. Now you're making mistakes all over the place and in other areas. Right. And guess what? Like I said before, guess what's happening when you're playing these mistakes? Your body, your mind, your hand is learning these mistakes. Your hand, your body, your mind is learning every single time you play something. I can't stress that enough. So what you need to do is you need to isolate the problem within probably three, maybe four notes. Right. So if my lick is this. So this right here, so I'm going to shorten and isolate my mistake to the closest possible thing I can practice, which is going to be this. Now I'm using a thumb switch, which isn't, which isn't the best fingering. I should probably do this. Okay. And I'm going to practice that a good five to 10 times because I just made a mistake. I need to relearn that part. And that's what's, what I'm going to do from there is start to back it up. Right. And then I have this. And again, like if you're reading this. So I'd come off this A. And then I'd come from the C. Right. And then I just keep backing it up until I've moved back to the beginning. I think I'm changing the line as I'm demonstrating, but that's okay. You get the picture, right? But what you cannot do is you cannot keep going back to the top of the piece. Like so many students make mistakes in the middle of the tune and then they go all the way back to the top, right? All the way back. You cannot do this. This is not helping you learn. And it's wasting hours and hours and years of your life and your progress. Please, please do not do this, okay? So this is the learning process. So now we're upping the tempo. We're using a metronome. I have, a, I have the tempo, you know, and it's going, or let, let's use this other lick here too. That's, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're learning. And again, this is the same for chords, everyone. If you're practicing your drop twos, let's say you're practicing this or you're practicing with extensions. Right, if you make a mistake in there, I just made a mistake. <laughs> so I didn't put the flat nine there. So I put a, 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 a natural nine. So I'm not going to go back to the beginning. I'm going to play the chord a couple times. Before I start over again, I'm going to play that chord to make sure I know what it is. Okay. I'm teaching my body to play this chord. Okay. And then I'm, I'm again, I'm going to turn the metronome off. I'm going to relearn the whole process. Boom. 
boom, boom. Okay, I'm still teaching myself again. I'm unlearning the mistake I just played. Because again, my body learned the mistake. I need to relearn the correct way slowly. Okay, I'm gonna add my metronome back in. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. And then I'm gonna up my metronome. And then I've, I've put that together. Okay. So that's step number four. I'm going to wrap up here. Step number five is going to be integration, integration. So step number four was the learning process, right? And how to practice the exercise that we've set for ourselves in step number three. Step number three was what to practice. We're picking our exercises, right? Step number four is the actual process, the learning process that you need to implement with your discipline. Okay. To make sure you're learning in the correct way to practice the exercise. Now, step number five, we've practiced our tool, right? And it's time to integrate it into a tune. How do we do that? Whether it's an improv line, a chord, anything, right? The first thing you're going to want to do, let's say you've just learned your drop twos. Let's stick with these drop twos. Okay. The first thing you're going to want to do is play through the tune slowly and simply integrate whatever it is you've practiced without any pressure, no metronome, no melody, no anything, right? And again, this is a comping tool. My focus here is a comping or like if I'm playing a melody, maybe I'm comping for myself, right? But this is kind of more of a comping tool. You know, there's other things too that can happen. So I, I would move through my tune and I'm just playing my drop twos. And then maybe it goes to my uh, two, five and F. And then back to D again. So I'm simply moving through my tune, playing the new tool that I've just practiced. Now the integration part should only be like five to 10 minutes. It really shouldn't take that long, right? So now I've integrated these. And again, any, if you do make a mistake though, right, you want to go back, you want to revert, you want to stop and ensure that you don't make more mistakes. Just practice correctly the second time, like immediately right after you make the mistake, oh, I mistake, I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to play the right thing next so that my body is learning correctly. Right. Then finally, put the metronome on for your tune, whatever tune it is that you're working on at a slow tempo, right? And comp through the entire thing. And when you get to the spots where you're integrating this particular tool, right? In this case, it's your drop twos. You're going you're gonna to be able to integrate those and play them naturally as they come out in the tune. Right. And as you get more comfortable with the tool, you'll be able to kind of add some different types of textures, some more musicality. But in the initial stages, it's really just about integrating the tool into the tune, getting used to it. And again, this shouldn't be the, the bulk of your practice. This should be easy now because we've done all the heavy lifting before. This is just the in integration part, right? Because we've done all the heavy lifting of all the different types of practicing methods, the learning method. This should come out pretty naturally at this point. whatever it is you're practicing. Now this could be a lot of different things. You could be practicing chord progressions. You could be practicing voicings, the blues, styles, uh, any sort of theoretical concept, right? Th that would, you would take on this process for this five-step process that I just taught, right? Let me go back through the steps before I wrap up. So number one, discipline. Make sure you're, you're in a disciplined state of mind before practicing something, okay? You can't show up and then start to play what you know already or kind of let your mind wander. That's not good practice habits, right? Just set five minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, right? Of practice time. And you're going to start to build the habit of good practice.
practice, like of, you know, good practice habits. And then you can start to increase that time. Your, your, your mental focus is literally, it's a, it's like, um, it's learns. You learn toughness. You learn mental focus. You learn to elongate the duration of time where your mind can focus on practicing, right? So you start at 15 minutes. Okay. You did 15 minutes. You struggled. You're tired. I get it. And then, and then you do that for a week, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes. Eventually you get to an hour where you're loving the practice. You're loving the process of practicing. And because you're following this five-step process, you're actually making more improvement faster because you're learning the right way. Okay. Step number one, discipline. Step number two, goals and assessment. What are you trying to accomplish? Jazz piano is a cacophony of categories. You have solo piano, group piano, comping, voicings, um, you know, drop twos, uh, you know, rootless voicings. You have improv, modal improv, scales, modes, like what is your goal, right? It needs to be specific. It can't just be, I want to learn how to play jazz piano. What style do you want to learn? I want to learn how to play solo piano. Okay. What type of piece do you want to learn how to play? I want to learn how to play medium swing tunes. Okay, great. What, you know, what medium swing tune do you want to learn? Okay. I want to learn, um, Night and day, you know, I said that as an example. Okay, let's look through night and day. Well, it's got these particular types of chords in it, right? Do you know all these chords? Well, no, I don't know my minor seven flat five. Okay, great. That's a good starting point because you're obviously going to need to learn how to play minor seven flat five chords to play night and day, not to mention a whole other slew of jazz standards. Now, let's say you do know all the chords and you can play through night and day, but you're playing rootless root position voicings. What's your next step to make things better? This is where the assessment comes in. Well, you need better voicings. You need better system and arrangements of your voicings in the solo piano category that you're working at. So goals and assessments is really important because it's going to direct and dictate all the other steps to come, right? Step number three, what do you practice? Now, unfortunately, this is a really tough one for a lot of people because, again, unless you're a jazz piano school member, you're not really going to have access to really strict curriculum set exercises that are going to help you get better. But you can kind of, again, assess for yourself and, you know, think about it. Well, if you don't know your minor seven flat five chords, it's a pretty good idea to practice them, right? And that's going to help you learn your tune. So what to practice. And again, I showed you my voicing techniques. Again, for improv lines, there's a whole other slew of things to work on your improv. I'm not going to get into that today. Step number four is going to be the learning process. The learning process. Practice things correctly the first time. Go beyond slow than you would think you would need to ensure that you're playing things correctly. And I guarantee you, the more you can play something correctly from the get-go, from the get-go, like from the very first time you place your hand on the piano, you're going to drastically cut your practice, practice time in half. I get sheet music for large written jazz band piano lead sheets, and it's very overwhelming to even me, to me. And what I need to do is that when I'm learning uh, a score, you know, like I played Porgy and Bess a couple years back. I remember this very vividly because it was very overwhelming um, at SF Jazz. And my piano um, part for Porgy and Bess, as you can imagine, it was dense. It wasn't just chords. Like I had lots of written areas to play Porgy and Bess with a full big band and two singers, Porgy and Bess, right? At SF Jazz in the main hall. <laughs> so... I didn't have much time to learn this. So what I did, literally, my goal was obviously to learn the music, but the, the point for me was that I needed to focus so strictly and disciplined on making sure that I hit every single note as I was practicing the certain parts where I wasn't comping, right? You know, because in the, your jazz big band lead sheets, you have comping and then you have written parts at some, at some points. I had lots of written parts. When I was practicing that, because I didn't have much time to practice, I think I had like a week and a half maybe, I needed to practice so accurately and focus that I was ensuring that I wasn't hitting any wrong notes because I was teaching my hands, I was teaching my body, my mind to play the correct notes the first time so that I learned it the first time, the second time, the third time. Did I make mistakes? Obviously. Like you're going to make mistakes no matter what, but in those times you do make mistakes, again, you need to chunk it isolate the problem. Don't go back to the beginning. Don't go back eight measures, 16 measures, 32 measures. Do not go back to the top. Go back one measure and tackle that issue. Play it 10 times right without any tempo. 
so that you've relearned it and you've gotten rid of the mistake and then start to move your way back. Add on one measure backwards, add on two measures backwards, right? And if you make a mother mistake, go back to the, the, you come back to the same exact process over and over and over again, okay? Step number five is integration, integration. So after I was done kind of practicing through the entire, um, all the written parts, um, th this is a kind of a different example, but obviously I needed to get it up to speed. So I slowly increased the metronome, got it up to speed. If you're working on any sort of tools that you're looking to in interject, inject into tunes, right? You'll work the tools through the tunes, Let's say you're practicing your drop two, you work it through the blueprint, and then after you've played it without the metronome, slowly put on your metronome. Again, this process is not a long process because you've already done the majority of the work. You work that through, and then essentially it will start to bring the piece together, up your metronome tempo, start to add some inflections, some rhythm, some musicality, some textures, and, eventually, and then your tune essentially will take on exactly what you've practiced, okay? That's it, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Again, I know there's a lot of information there. I'd highly recommend you go back and listen to everything that I went through because this is a really, really great episode. Um, go to jazzpianoschool.com to check out all the free education we have. If you want to get on the live stream podcast audience that I have right now, I'm about to do a Q&A with, go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast. jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast. Uh, with that being said, as always, have a fantastic day and happy practicing. All right. <clears throat> so this is my voice there. All right, cool. We got a lot of questions here, which is excellent. I'm so glad. I'm going to go through these here. Um, all right, Daniel says, how do you approach your melodic ideas that fit those chords you're playing? Okay, so any type of questions like these, they're fantastic because you need, again, this is hard without having a teacher but you have to understand what it is your goal is, right? We're, so we're at step number two here. So Daniel, if you, by melodic ideas, we want to get more specific always. <clears throat> so does melodic ideas mean improv lines that you want over that? Does it mean melodic ideas in between your, the melody, you know? So um, if you're talking about melodic lines that fit the type of extensions I was playing, right? There's a lot of different types of ways to move through those types of extensions. So if your practice process or your goal is to create improv lines that move through these extensions, you're going to want tools to do that. Now, one of the tools you can use here is an altered scale, right? And again, this just comes, someone needs to, t t to tell you this. <clears throat> so an altered scale is going to fit with this particular set of, of, of um, extensions here. So if your goal is to increase your improv knowledge in playing with these types of extensions, then that's great. We've done step number two. We're on to step number three. What do you practice? Well, your, I just said your altered scale. You need to learn your altered scale. Right? And so you would learn your altered scale. Now the process of improv takes on a couple new things, right? How do we spontaneously use these? And I have a whole system for improv, but we want to focus on our chord tones. We want to focus on using the scale. Go back a couple podcasts and listen to three steps to practice improvising. You'll get a lot of information from that. Right, but you're going to develop a relationship with the scale. You're going to start to work with it and then you're going to start to use it slowly oops sorry i'm using different extensions here right i'm literally just going to play through my lines slowly to start to inject the altered scale into my voicings right now i would do something like this I would do it again. Then I would do it again. And then I would just keep doing that slowly and playing with the different, 
you know, the, the different ways I can use this altered scale, right? And I start to up the tempo, maybe add some time. And I'd start to build my relationship around that particular tool. Finally, again, the last step is the putting it into tunes. So now that I have my tool, my altered scale, I can now, right, um, integrate that into any tune I want where I've practiced my altered scale. Hopefully that helps. Trevor, I don't know if this is a good tip, but each day I'll practice something like major seven chords and first inversion. Later on, I usually practice tunes. Yeah. That's perfect. Exactly. So again, guys, you want to go through the process, right? What's your goal? What's your assessment? Like if you're, if you don't know your major seventh chords or you want to work on your major seventh chords, that, that would be your goal. And if you want to learn your first inversion of your major chords, that would be your goal too. So again, then you're on to step three, what to practice, right? So then you're going to practice your first inversion of all your major seventh chords. You're going to go through the learning process, right? Make sure you don't make mistakes. And then finally, you're going to integrate those first inversions into chords. And again, there's a lot of ways you can practice your first inversions though. Remember that, you know, you can integrate them in your left hand for comping and soloing. You can integrate them just for comping, right? With both hands, but that's great. Um, at this time, if I ever see a major seven call on, I'll play first inversion that forced me to use. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Perfect. The, the drilling, you know, is, is really up to you. I mean, if you've practiced a, a major set, if you've practiced a first inversion and you can, you can integrate it into tunes and it comes out naturally, then your drilling is done. If you can utilize that tool spontaneously without thinking, then the drilling part is done. Like you, you've, you've used that tool and you can now integrate it into any tune you want, right? You have complete freedom, right? Learning freedom. You've learned freedom over that tool. And you can now you can now use it in any tune you want. Christopher, he says, hi, uh, hi, Brendan, excellent subject. How do you approach practicing lines and taking it through the keys? So the important thing about, I, I forgot to touch on this, but I wanted to. The important thing about practicing lines, like the line I was showing you guys before. Uh, what was it? Was it that? Something like that. Let's say that's your, that's your line. Uh, a lot of times students practice the lines, it, full lines like that. And I don't, it's not particularly useful to you. What I recommend and is a really great section in jazz piano school is the Lego building blocks. So you want to focus on your Legos here. Like what are the building blocks of this line? Well, the first amazing building block that you want to practice is this approach to start off the line. Now look at the first note that I'm hitting here. It's an E flat. Would you ever think to hit an E flat over a D minor seven chord on the downbeat? Right? You probably wouldn't right off the bat, but because of this building block, this is an approach. This is a bebop approach to the third. I finally hit my third, my approach note, my chord tone. Right? That right there is a Lego. It's a building block from this entire line. Okay, so it's not as important. So many students worry about getting the entire line. What's gonna help you more in learning improv and freedom to, more importantly, the freedom to spontaneously improv isn't practicing full lines. Cause that's not, let's, let's not kid around here. That's not freedom, right? When you're, pra when you're playing full lines and they're simply, you're like waiting to the spot in a tune when that line's gonna come up and you're like, okay, you know, your, your solo is not too good. And then finally you get to the spot where you've practiced your line. Oh, okay. And then the rest of your solo is, is not good. You know, that's not freedom. That's not spontaneously improvising. So what's going to help you the most is if you dissect your improvisation, right? So you would practice this building block. So what's happening here? We're starting on the flat nine. We're moving to the natural nine or chord scale half step below chord scale above. Half step below to the third. So essentially this is like a double chromatic here to the third. 
And then I would take that through the keys because I want to learn that building block over all my minor seven chords so I can use it spontaneously over any minor, minor seven chord I see in a tune, right? I don't want to just be able to play this one line, uh, you know, over one area of a tune. And I want to be able to use the different segments of the line to connect into other things that maybe I want to play. Maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe I want to go like this. Uh, sorry. Maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to do that. Right? But the, the thing is that I've learned this particular Lego here. Right? And I can use that Lego however I want in so many different types of ways. So you want to dissect your line and take apart these Legos and practice them through the keys, right? And then that's going to help your spontaneous improv so much more than practicing these full three measure, four measure, eight measure lines and even just whole transcriptions of solos, right? Don't just play through whole transcriptions of solos. That's not very helpful. I mean, it can be helpful for textures and musicality if you're putting on the record and trying to mimic the, the sounds, the touch, but for the theoretical knowledge, that's separate, right? Just for the knowledge of improv or the knowledge of spontaneously improvising and, and playing physical notes, you want to be aware of the Lego building blocks within specific lines. All right, David says, I practice individual blocks, scales, chords, etc., and full songs, okay? Usually relying on memorization, but it's hard to integrate and know what blocks to use when can't seem to hear it myself, okay? Also, any suggestions how to practice away performance anxiety? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, so, David, yeah, that's, let me see. Right, so I think the, the, the particular spot that you're in, again, we always want to use the system, the five-step system I taught you. So you're in a spot where you're practicing a lot of different things, right? A lot of different things. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into jazz and like the, the way you want to sound. And the way you want to sound, the, the way we all want to sound, the way I wanted to sound too when I was young and growing up was I just wanted to sound great, you know? So I practiced so many different things. I'm practicing chords, scales, all these different types of things. But we need to kind of, practice something and then integrate it and then again reassess like where are we so like David <clears throat> let's take the chords for example we just want to really narrow down our focus like what chords this is rhetorical but what chords are you practicing like if you're practicing your major seventh chords then you would go on to ask yourself the question am I able to integrate these major seventh chords into tunes and when I say integrate, I mean, am I able to spontaneously and physically execute the chord within a tune without going back and without making mistakes? So when I, for example, when I see a G major seven chord come up, boom, I can play that. No problem. Right now playing tunes and improv are completely separate. They're completely separate ball games and they need to be approached in two completely separate ways. It's the same for a lot of different jazz piano categories. You can't assume that because you're practicing chords and scales, like everything's going to get better. No, like improv is a practice route and it's its own specific goal. Just working on improv, that's a whole world in itself. Just working on how to play solo piano tunes with just chords, that's a whole ball game in itself. So you have to do a really deep dive assessment of exactly what it is you want. Like I know you in particular, David, you're looking to play more cocktail, cocktail style piano ballads or arrangements like that. So I know you're trying to get probably runs in with your scales, but you want to go level by level by level, right? So just focus on playing the tune with some lush arrangements, right? And I may go through night and day without, without even the melody and just playing some chords and making sure that I can arrange this tune with these chords. Sorry.
Now again, that's an advanced demonstration. Let me back it up. Maybe I just do this. I'm just playing these chords here, just with shells. Right? So we want to kind of, we want to peel away the layers, right, of the onion and our goal based on our assessment and where we want to go. Now we can get everything in jazz piano and obviously that's our goal, but we can't do it all at once. We can't, we can't expect to practice all the things within jazz piano, right, um, all at once. We need to take the building blocks. The more you can take your goal and assessment and narrow it down as far as you can to exactly what you're trying to accomplish. And this could be as narrow as, okay, I need more extensions in my playing. I need more colors in my playing now. Or my, my assessment is I'm not utilizing two-hand voicings correctly. I need to learn that strategy, right? Um, that is how narrow of a focus that you need to get. Now, as far as performance anxiety, um, <laughs> just keep performing. Yes, that's, that's a good one. I mean, I've always, I still get nervous. I get nervous to this day when I play concerts. Um, it goes away much faster than it did, but it depends on the music too. I mean, if I have a, if I have a hard piece to play, like I said, the poor game best thing that was, I, I was nervous for that, you know, and it, it, it just means that you are, you care, right? And you want to do a good job and that's great. Um, breathe, take your time, right? And enjoy it. Try and enjoy playing the music. And that helps me a lot is that no matter what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to die, you know, <laughs> like, and to have fun because the moment goes by so fast and I miss, I miss performing so much. I haven't performed in so long and I miss it so much being up on stage and making music in the moment because it's such a gorgeous thing that when things aren't recorded, I love live music because nothing's recorded in these moments. You can never get them back, right? And that's why they're so precious is because they're there and then they're gone. And there's moments in music when I'm performing with other musicians, it's like usually when I experience something, if I go out with friends or something or I go to a wedding, like in the moment I'm having fun, but like I look back I usually live my happiness kind of as like a, like a look back, right? So I'm like looking back and I'm like, oh, that was, that was fun. I had a good time. You know, I'm still having a good time. But like there's moments in music where like I'm sitting there playing and I'm like, man, this right here, like if I could just bottle this up, like I'd be happy for the rest of my life. Like this is pure joy and fulfillment like right here, right now in the moment as it's happening, you know? So like the more you can start to understand that and just take in the moment, the, the less anxiety you have. Because anxiety comes from being afraid to make mistakes, you know, or wanting to do a good job, you know, not wanting to crash and burn. And that's okay. If you've prepared and you've practiced and you feel confident about where you're at, that's great. You know, if you haven't practiced, you're going to obviously have more anxiety, you know. So hopefully those tips help. Dwight Miller says, um, how many max different things should you practice during a 90 minute session? That's a great question too. These are great questions. So, um, you know, Dwight, I, I would say that there's a max. I mean, I think if you're able to, if you're able to make progress on the steps that I, I kind of just went through in the podcast and you're really able to like learn something and practice through something correctly, like correctly, if you've got all these things honed down, you know, you know what your goal is, you know what you're practicing, and then your learning process is on point. Like you're not, you're not going too fast. You're not repetitively making mistakes over and over and over and over again. You can practice as many things as you want. It doesn't matter. Your body and your mind and your hands will continue learning. Like as long as you're disciplined though, right? These five steps are so important. And I know a lot of people are going to write this off like, oh yeah, okay. And that's what usually happens. But like, just like if people, if you can just trust me and just like follow these steps, if you can follow these steps all the time, like you'll make progress so much faster as long as you're working the steps. So practice for four hours and on as many things as you want, but follow the four five steps that I taught you and it's fine. But if within those four hours, if your mind starts to go and you're making repetitive mistakes and you're not, you're not stopping, you're not going through the learning process, you don't really have a goal. You don't really know what you're doing. It's not going to be good practice time. 
Um, Dwight also says, what is the ratio of time between review and the new thing per practice session? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, great question too, is that, um, you want to get something up to a point in, in, I go by a time metronome in jazz piano school where 60 is just starting out. 90 is kind of getting the hang of it. 120 is solid. 120 is really kind of the point where it's solid. You can start to integrate it into tunes. Um, 150 is swinging. And 180 is mastery. So if you can play something at 180 or above, it's pretty much mastered. And spontaneously, I mean, like without having to make mistakes or anything. It's clean, no mistakes. All right. Debbie says, you said to not go back to the beginning when you are, when you make a mistake. Does this assume you're looking at sheet music? Yeah, Debbie. So this assumes that you're looking at sheet music. Like if you're reading a tune. If you're injecting a tool into a tune and, and like if you're reading sheet music, of course, like if you get to a spot in sheet music, but also if you're, if you're working on comping, like let's say you're injecting the, um, the drop two I was talking about. Right? So if I'm if I'm practicing this and I'm injecting it into a tune, integrating it into a tune, and it's in the middle of the tune, I want to start to practice the integration of this in the middle of the tune. So um, So like night and day goes to E flat, right? So let's say I was practicing my drop two there. It's a little low there. Right? Maybe I'm practicing that. If the only spot where that happens in night and day is in the middle of the tune, you don't want to start comping from the beginning of the tune. Get to that sp spot, make a mistake, and then go all the way back to the tune. You want to take it from there and just go back one measure. Play it. And then go back two measures. Then play it again. Go back three measures. Play it again. So forth until you've worked your way all the way back to the beginning. Now let's say you go back through the tune and you're playing it and you get to that spot and you make a mistake. Maybe you play that. Don't go back to the beginning of the tune. Go back a couple measures again and do the same process over and over and over again. But don't don't go back to the beginning of the tune because it's just a complete waste of time. And so many, uh, literally when, when compounded with the amount of times and rehearsals and people practicing that they go back to the beginning and don't isolate the actual issue, the compounded, the amount of time lost over the course of year, it's it's literally years of practice time lost. And with that tip alone, I mean, again, you'll you'll save so much time. It's just incredible. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Wonder Waffles, awesome. What's the best way to become one with your instrument? Like how Bill Evans talks about his life being. Yeah, that's. Um, Again, that's kind of like relationship building with the tool, right? So you're you're you want to get to a point where you're expressing through that, and this takes so much. I mean, it just takes relationship building. I don't like to call it practice, but because like um, you know, I can learn. Let's go back to the um, altered scale for a second. You know, I I can still build my relationship better with this particular tool. I mean, I'm at a point where I know my altered scale really well over my G7, obviously over lots of keys. I use it a lot, but I still have more to dive into. Now, it, it is one with me. You know, it is one with my hand. I don't have to think about it. But again, if there's a tool that you're working on, you're going to need to spend time with it, right? It's just like getting to know someone. You're going to need to go out with them a lot. You know, friends, family, whoever. You need to spend lots and lots of time with this particular person. Now, you'll get to a point, maybe a year, maybe two years, where you think you know your tool, right? And it's pretty good, and it's swinging. And again, you're pretty comfortable with the tune, two years, you know? But still, there's like something missing, right? Right? And you just need to keep going deeper with your tool. Just keep developing a relationship with that tool. Spend time on that. Don't do anything else, you know? And just spend time with, like, Bill just, he, you know, he spent so much time on his left hand. 
like just working on his left hand, not even in tunes, right? In progressions and chords and obviously in tunes as well. Like he would, you know, I, he would play full tunes just with his left hand alone, his runs, his lines. He was developing relationship with his left hand so that when he did put his right hand together with it, his relationship was so solid that he knew it literally inside and out. So ju you just want to spend more time, like once spend way more time than you, you would even think that you need on particular tools. Tom, how's it going? I'm on lesson 18, practicing parallel modes. How would you go about integrating <clears throat> that into tunes? That's a great question too. So your parallel modes is more about uh, learning the functionality of chords within tunes. So essentially like if you, you wanna learn the features and characteristics of your modes, right? So if you have a C major scale, and then you play a D, a C Dorian scale, right? You have your flat three, your flat seven. So essentially the, the parallel modes is more knowledge based so that you understand like through the analyzation of a tune, what particular modes are going to work best over certain, um, certain chords and certain situations, because it's not to say that a lot of jazz tunes, they just have two, five ones. So it doesn't require that much in-depth analysis. Like two, five ones are a basic structure, meaning you're going to get Dorian, Mixolydian, and Ionian, right? But once you get into more complicated tunes, there's going to be chords where you can start to change the sound, right? For example, if you wanted to change the sound of your improvisation, instead of playing Dorian, right? Just like the C, um, the C Dorian scale, right? There's Dorian, but... Your Phrygian, right, has four flats, flat two, flat three, flat six, flat seven, right? So if I were to play Phrygian, you know, over my D, my D Phrygian here, you know, or whatever I'm soloing is, I can change the tune. If I want to play Lydian, you know, over my G7 chord, I could do that. Right, adding the sharp 11, um, it doesn't matter. And again, like, you know, your here's your your Phrygian there. If I were to play Phrygian, so and again, you can you can switch it up. However, so it's it's kind of like not like um, it's oh sorry, I didn't even have the piano on there. My bad. <clears throat> but it, it's more about the knowledge and theoretical knowledge of the of the tool uh, moving into the tune. Right. And again, most tunes, you know, after you analyze them, it will give you a better perspective of what particular mode to use. And that's why parallel modes are so important because it's about learning the colors of each mode and the characteristics of each mode. So many times when we practice modes like this, that's easy because all I'm doing is taking the C major scale and just starting on a new note. But playing your mode starting from one note really gives you a, a uh, an insight into the characteristics, right? Ionian, okay? Dorian, flat three, flat seven, Phrygian, flat two, flat three, flat six, flat seven, so on, right? And then we get to Lydian, sharp four, flat seven, right? And then obviously Mixolydian, flat seven, so on. So by knowing the colors, you can more, uh, you have better um, control over that to implement them into tunes. All right. Let me see here. Let me see. Is it okay when playing in a band to just left hand comp with three, five, seven, nine voicing for certain chords? Third seem cliche, but sometimes three, five, seven, nine voicing for certain chords. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Three, five, seven, nine, your rootless voicings for... Those should be for your minor chords or your your major chords. Your three your three five seven nine pattern is going to be your rootless voicing for your minor chords. So here's my three five seven nine for D minor, right? I can't use three five seven nine for my G seven though. I mean, you can, you can, but you know, this is this is kind of like. A, a blander voicing like if you're a more advanced player then you can use this for a particular type of sound right I mean sometimes I do that 
But initially off the bat, your 3579 should be more used for your minor and your major. And then from here, you're gonna go to this, 79313 for your dominance, or 31379. Right, but this particular voicing for your dominant chords, just off the bat, is not the progression curriculum of learning particular voicings. But yes, to answer your question, 3579 definitely works. How do you practice improv if you cannot pre hear music in your mind or pre imagine what each note, degree of scale can sound? Do you just use theory, harmony, and rely on them in emotion? John says. John, hey, good to, good to um, see you or talk to you. <laughs> Me talking. <laughs> um, yes. To, short answer, yes. So essentially, like I said the other day, this is a really great analogy, but a lot of people think that we need to pre-hear our lines. Now, this only happens um, through practice. So we start in a place where we don't know, and then as we practice without knowing, we get to a place where we can pre-hear. But there's no way to pre-hear without the practice and relationship building of certain tools. For example, when we're born, we don't know what anything sounds like. So if you were, if, you know, when you're three or something, I mean, you're learning a lot, but like you wouldn't know what a, a, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, like a pothole slamming would sound like, you know, we're afraid of loud noises because we don't know what they are. They don't know, we don't know what ambulances sound like. We don't know what a door shutting sound like. We don't know what lots of different things sound like. And so if someone asks us, well, what does it sound like? We don't know. We don't know. So the only way to hear that and pre-hear is by hearing it, right? And with the way we do that is through practice. It's through slow theoretical practice of particular tools. The example I gave you before is that the Lego building block that I was talking to, um, who was it? I forget. Dwight, maybe? I'm not sure. This, this particular line, right? A lot of you may not have been able to, right? A lot of you may not have been able to pre-hear that. But because you're practicing this Lego block in all keys, right? You better know that after you've gone through the five-step process that I taught you today and you've practiced and worked on this, guess what? In your lines, your ear, through all the repetitive work, it's going to know exactly what that sounds like. And it's the same thing in life. Like if you know what a car horn sounds like because you've heard it over and over and over and over and over again. Same with a car alarm, right? All of us could sing back a car alarm, you know? Like, right? Because we heard it over and over and over again. So through the practice, through the process of practicing, I can now in integrate this into my solos and know how this sounds like. You know, maybe I do that. But it'll come out naturally because I can kind of hear what is happening in that. Hey, Jay, thanks for joining us. I'm about to wrap up, but. This is a great session. I highly recommend you go back and watch it. Um, so that's through the practice and theoretical process of practicing first. And then our ear develops as we're practicing it. As we're practicing it and we start to get a better relationship with it. And then after we've developed the relationship with it, we can now start to use it spontaneously in our lines. So yes, you don't need to pre-hear music. Um, as long as you can practice and theoretically move through the exercises, you start to, you start your ear, trains your ear. And also obviously when you're listening to things, don't just listen to the solos, like listen to specific textures, right? So, you know, maybe there's, there's some particular texture that you liked and you don't know what it was. Like maybe it was the way someone rolled the chord. Maybe they did that instead of just going like this. It's usually not the notes that most players are playing. It's how they're playing it, right? Notes are obviously important, but like a lot of it too is our articulation and the way they're approaching it. John, I hope that helps. Um, Debbie, I've been told that the best way to learn to improvise is just to do it, fake it until you make it as well as to learn other solos. Um, I don't particularly agree with those the, that perspective. The whole fake it till you make it thing is, um, you know... It sounds good until you, <laughs> until you go and try it and you really have no idea what you're, you're doing. 
Um, you know, it's just like the expression goes like, what's, what's the best way to teach someone how to swim, right? Just throw them in the ocean. Well, if you throw someone in the ocean who doesn't know how to swim, probably nine out of 10 times that person's going to drown, <laughs> right? They're not just going to like swim magically, <laughs> right? Or if you don't know how to drive, the best, <laughs> the best starting point to driving isn't just to like put someone in the car and let them drive, <laughs> you know, or like put them out on the highway or in the streets, right? That person's going to get killed. Um, same with a surgeon, you know, like think about all these things, same with flying a plane, you know, just fake it till you make it. Like if that was your pilot, would you want someone to do that? If that was your surgeon, would you want your surgeon to fake it until they made it? <laughs> like, no, we don't want that. Right. So, Hey, no problem. Mr. Wonderfuls. Have a good week. Uh, I'm going to resend this out later in the week. So if you guys missed a lot of it, you can rewatch it. But, um, we want to discipline ourselves, right? To learn, to learn the knowledge, to learn the knowledge of exactly what is happening in improvisation. Like what is happening? Like why does Oscar sound like Oscar? Why does Chick sound the way he did? You know, RIP. Why does Herbie sound the way Herbie does? So there's certain elements and like bebop players, bebop is a specific thing. You know, it's a specific genre that can and be learned, can be learned systematically. Just with like with any other thing, just like cooking, right? You can bake a cake. There's lots of different ways to bake a cake, right? It's the same with jazz. So like, how do we bake a cake? Do we fake it till we make it? Or do we learn the foundational principles of just like baking a simple cake? From there, once we know how to bake a cake, we can start to change it. We can add different frosting. Maybe we go chocolate instead of vanilla. Maybe we add sprinkles. Maybe we add fruit, right? So we learn different components and we build up the layers, the foundation to certain principles. And that's what allows us to move forward and make progress with an understanding of the path and the knowledge and the structure. When people say fake until you make it, they probably don't really know how to teach you, to be honest, or they don't really know the process themselves or they can do it, but they can't explain it. That's not a bad thing necessarily. I had so many teachers you know, I was like, hey, I'm not going to say their name, but so-and-so, how do I, can you show me how you did that little section there with the drop twos? And he was like, drop twos. Like he had no theoretical knowledge and you know, that's okay too, but like, they're not going to be the best person to help you or, or guide you through the process. Cause they can't really explain it to you. They can offer many other things, you know, but like, there's no, there's no process. There's no path. There's no structure to the learning. Again, that whole thing is just like, watch me. And then you try and do it, you know? So Debbie, I mean, it's not my philosophy. Some people take on that, but not me particularly. Guys, I'm going to take, I think this will be the last one. Yeah, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Ray says, um, <laughs> oh yeah, if you, oh, you said it right there. It seems if I just fake it, I'll be learning lots of mistakes. Yes, exactly. You will be learning lots of mistakes. Exactly, exactly. Is Dorian, Phrygian, Alien mixed are the only ones for minor chords? For major harmony, Ray, yes. But once you get into minor harmony, you're going to have obviously different types of minor scales, right? Natural minor, harmonic minor, melodic minor. Um, but that's relating to <clears throat> minor harmony. Um, this is major harmony that you're talking about. The Dorian, Phrygian, Alien comes from your seven diatonic chords. Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, this is all diatonic to a major key, meaning these chords are based off of the C major scale. So I'm creating chord structures only with the use of a major scale. Now, if I take a minor scale, let's say I take a melodic minor scale, I can create chords based off of that. You see what chord I have on my flat three? I have a, an E flat major augmented chord. Now I'm getting this chord because I've built this chord using a melodic major scale, right? A melodic major scale. So all these chords are diatonic to the C melodic major scale. If I take my C major scale again, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, Locrian, so on and so forth. Those are all diatonic to that C major scale. So when you take other scales, chords are built using, no problem, Christopher, thanks, thanks for um, being here. 
when you build build chords are build built off of scales, right? That's why scales are so important and vice versa. You know, um, scales are kind of built from chords as well, but usually the scale is going to dictate the, the diatonic chords and how they're used and things like that. This is really deep into theory and theoretical knowledge, but um, <clears throat> uh, you can go really deep with all these different types of chords and all these different types of scales and it can get pretty deep, but just knowing, you know, your, your, your major harmony and your minor harmony, your two, five, one minor harmony, it's really, it's going to get you all you need to play jazz tunes, right? If you want to go way deep, you can, it's a rabbit hole. Like it's up to you how deep you want to go. But, um, as long as you know, a little bit of minor harmony, your major harmony, you're all set. All right, Rick. Yeah, this was uh, this was really insightful. I hope it was insightful for a lot of you. And um, again, I'll, I'm going to send this out later. It will be available on the website too. And so um, thank you guys all so, all so much for watching. And um, I think that's it. Um, I just want to say real quick that if anyone is interested, I'm going to be running a 90-day accelerator program. Okay, and Jay and some people on here were um, had a had uh, interest in joining the program. And so I've moved the program back to the fall. So if you're interested, please let me know. It will allow you to work um, with me personally. It will allow you to, to get lessons from me, get lessons from my team, work with a group of people. And it's going to be a three-month program. And so if you are interested, uh, just let me know. You can shoot me an email or essentially just go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash group and you can get on the waiting list for that and you'll get more details and information about that. So um, I think that's it. Hope you guys have a wonderful week and um, I will talk to you later. And so I'm going down the list of podcasts that people sent in a, a while ago. And so I'm just going to keep going down the list and uh, we'll keep checking out. But until then, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks so much.